Hello and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, first lecture of this seminar. Usually seminars don't have lectures per se, but uh, allow me to set uh, the ground and understand the basic elements, the three basic elements that uh, pertain to this uh, seminar on the United Nations Globalization and Civil Society. So we will have uh, these uh, three series uh, of lecture. The first one uh, will be devoted uh, on the understanding of basic dynamics and important dimensions of globalization. The second one uh, will be on the study of the United Nations in its past history, current configuration and future uh, trends, as well as uh, for the third uh, globalization uh, lecture that will be focused in particular on global civil society and the relation of civil society with other sectors and uh, particularly with the United Nations and in the context of globalization. So uh, I'm going to focus uh, and show this uh, PowerPoint that uh, should be helpful for everyone to understand what uh, globalization is about. So we will be looking at globalization from a perspective from above and from below is we will be doing this in the context of the uh, international public service that is uh, also in the context of organizational uh, management and organizational configuration and institutional understanding, uh, systemic understanding from an economic point of view to political trends and uh, other elements. We will be looking at this particularly uh, keeping in mind uh, that uh, global civil society uh, represents uh, this uh, dynamism of uh, new organization, a new search for legitimacy, but also other uh, dynamics uh, in relation to globalization. So what is globalization? You know, it's something that uh, is like asking a fish what is water. You know, it's something that we all live in it, but it's somehow difficult uh, to uh, understand or define. So the purpose of this uh, course seminar is exactly to understand those dynamics because uh, these will will be part of your trends and the trends uh, that will lead uh, to eventually your own active engagement uh, in the international field uh, through your career, through your own uh, active participation as global citizens. So, you know, some of the, some of people would think that globalization is is uh, just simply this uh, good news of an integrated economic, political, and cultural system. Some would see this uh, dynamics uh, as an imposition, economic imposition, a cultural imposition, and, uh, and others might see this as a positive element, and others would see this with more skepticism. Actually, the introduction of your uh, book on the globalization readers has a beautiful uh, perspective as a beautiful uh, uh, introduction for uh, understanding the complexity and the diversity of uh, of uh, of uh, understanding of globalization. It says, globalization means different things to different people. To a Korean Pentecostal missionary, it means new opportunities to spread the faith and convert lost souls abroad. To a Dominican immigrant in the United States, it means growing new roots while staying deeply involved in the home village. To an Indian television viewer, it means simply sampling a variety of new show, some adapted from foreign formats. To a Chinese imperial worker, it means a chance to escape rural poverty by cutting threads of designer genes. To an American shoe company executive, it means in managing a far-flung supply chain to get products uh, to, to stores. To a Filipino global justice advocate, it means rules of the global game that favor the rich north over the poor south. So again, from this uh, little perspective, you understand that uh, when you ask, uh, is globalization good or bad, again, the answer is de it depends, because there are different perspectives from it. So what is globalization? You know. Uh, there are numerous perspectives uh, and studies that have evolved in the past at least 15 years 
uh, in the study of this uh, old and new phenomena. New because uh, there are some particular instances of the concentration of time and space, the rapidity of movement uh, from the economic transaction, transaction to uh, faster communication of goods, but also information and in certain less extent also of people that express uh, these new dimensions uh, of mobility, these new dimensions of uh, uh, international, global or world, uh, you know, traveling and interactions and exchanges. Something has always happened. You know, obviously, I, I invite you actually to look at this uh, globalization glossary with uh, various terms that uh, somehow exemplify some of the general notions uh, associated with globalization. This is as a, as a background. I invite you to look at that. Um, Noam Chomsky, you know him, you know, he's uh, one of those critics, uh, somehow uh, often uh, invited uh, by the so-called anti-globalization movement, which probably now is taking different shapes and different priorities, but somehow is part of those people, uh, like the Noemi Clams of, uh, or other uh, important uh, uh, sociologists and other scholars who have uh, studied globalization from a critical standpoint. I'm going to show you a little bit uh, his perspective, his works. Globalization. First of all, what is it? Yeah. I mean, globalization, uh, just used neutrally, globalization just means international integration. Okay. Everybody's in favor of it. I mean, it's been the core principle of the left and the working class movement since their origins. That's why every union is called an international, okay? Everybody's in favor of globalization. Now, the term has been appropriated by a narrow sector of power and privilege to refer to their version of international uh, integration, the investor rights version. And that makes sense for them to try to buy, you know, to own the term because anyone who's opposed to their version then becomes anti-globalization meaning some kind of primitive, wants to go back to the Stone Age or something like that. Uh, it's a bad error on the part of the critics of this investor rights uh, version of integration to accept the term anti-globalization. They should not. We're all in favor of globalization. The question is, is, is it going to be in the interests of people or in the interests of private power? But everybody's in favor of it. Okay, like nobody's opposed to the fact that you can call up your friend in Italy or something like that. That's integration. All right now, has internet, just using the term neutrally now, what, has it increased or has it decreased? Well, you know, in many respects, it's decreased. Uh, so if you look at international economic integration, uh, there are a lot of different measures. I mean, I mentioned one. There's a technical measure, which is convergence towards a single uh, price and wage, single market. Well, that's declining. Uh, during the period of the last 25 years, it's been declining. Furthermore, it's predicted to decline even. So again, as you can hear, you know, he has one perspective. Obviously, others uh, would think uh, that uh, he's not right because uh, some uh, more positivist view of globalization and supporters of globalization would argue that globalization has reduced poverty globalization uh, is beneficial, etc. But, you know, but before we get into these uh, controversies, let, let's start uh, for a moment to think about when did globalization begin? Because you can go back in history, not just starting from the 80s, but really, uh, or 1989, uh, but really something much uh, earlier. Now, uh, Thomas Friedman is one of those more positive uh, viewer of globalization, even though sometimes critiques uh, United States for falling behind in the technological uh, innovation that uh, other countries, particularly China and India, are capable of doing by taking advantage uh, of this flat world. Uh, let's see what he has to say about uh, globalization. So I started this book in March of 2004. I turned it in in December 
don't try this trick at home, kids. Okay. I blew out my forearms along the way, but in a fit of energy and curiosity produced the argument underlying the world is flat. Now the argument, the sort of meta argument, begins with my sense that there have been three great era of globalization. The first year I call Globalization 1.0. It lasted from 1492 until the early 1800s, the beginning of global arbitrage. And it shrunk the world, Globalization 1.0, from a size large to a size medium. And that year of globalization was really defined and characterized by countries globalizing. You went global through your country. The country was the dynamic agent of globalization, whether it was Spain exploring the New World, Britain colonizing India, Portugal, East Asia, the dynamic agent of globalization was the country. A globalization 2.0 lasted from the early 1820s until the year 2000. That's right, it just ended. It shrunk the world from size small, from size medium, excuse me, to size small. Only that era of globalization was really defined and spearheaded by companies globalizing. You went global through your company, companies searching for markets and for labor. While you were sleeping, or at least while I was sleeping, we entered globalization 3.0 from the year 2000 to the present. It's shrinking the world from size small to size tiny and flattening the global economic playing field at the same time. Only this year of globalization is not characterized by countries globalizing, is not spearheaded by companies globalizing. No, what is really new, really unique, really exciting, and really terrifying is that this year of globalization is built around individuals. What is new, unique, terrifying and exciting about this era of globalization is the degree to which it empowers and enjoins, the degree to which it enables and requires individuals to globalize themselves and to think of themselves as potential connectors, collaborators, and competitors with other individuals. So we hear that uh, Thomas Friedman has a more positive view, again, of globalization and in this uh, tripartition of the different era in his uh, uh, analysis of globalization. Uh, we understand that now we are facing a new era, according to him, it is more of focusing on the individual uh, capacity uh, to enter the global arena. Some would argue and still argues with Thomas Friedman that his view is still kind of a uh, naive or to focus on the technology or to focus on the economic aspect of it but not enough on other political or cultural and religious elements uh, that still pertain to globalization. So going back in history actually it would be important for us to understand that even before particularly before the famous 1492 you know, the beginning or the so-called discovering of the new continent, the Americas, uh, that led to new explorations. Really, the previous exploration still led to the primacy of the wealthy uh, empires of China, uh, the, all the goods of China, which is, it looks like that uh, nowadays we're still, we're going back, uh, looks like, in that uh, era. Uh, so prior to 1492. Uh, this is some example of uh, fruits and vegetables that, uh, you know, obviously came in in these exchanges uh, of uh, knowledge, exchanges of uh, diversity in this case, uh, particularly from the New World, that, that have uh, somehow spread all over and many have benefited, but also uh, many more have also paid the price, you know, think about uh, the lack of uh, diversity within the potato uh, famine, the led to the potato famine in Ireland, because only two varieties of potatoes were in existence and when a plague came in. And again today in these values and issues of uh, sustainability, biodiversity, etc., there are something 
else to reflect more uh, and go back in history to understand better what globalization is about. Uh, another example of the navigations and the exploration that probably brought back the so-called Black Plague in Europe that decimated uh, many of the countries at that time. It's something important to, to reflect again about uh, the spread of global uh, diseases and other type of things like this. The maps are important because, uh, you know, as you know, the maps uh, represent also a view of the world. You know, this is the based on the Mercatore uh, map, which was really, a, again, a road map for uh, exploration. So you see that uh, the uh, equator is somehow squeezed in the south, and the so-called uh, south is not as big as the north. The Peter's uh, projection of the world is a little different because it tries to rebalance this north and south, perhaps in another squeezed uh, view of the continents in the world, but uh, at least respecting this balance of north and south. But there are other maps like this one that shows obviously in a uh, purposely distorted manner uh, how absolute poverty uh, of people living in one dollar per day in terms of size, no percentage of living population is still a threat, particularly in the global south and also in the wonder and uh, promising uh, situation of India and China is still, they're still threatening many of the situations of uh, the life dig dignity. The same, on the other hand, you know, the inequality you can see here of people living over $200 per day, uh, you see there is uh, another disparity. So the global north and global south, there are dimensions that uh, have substituted the, low, the old the terminology um, of, uh, you know, third world, the second world, and first world. But uh, there's still some of the terminology, like fourth world, perhaps, is still in place, because uh, there are uh, numerous pockets of extreme level of poverty within the first world or within urban situations and so forth. Look at these uh, charts in terms of the colon colonization and decolonization. Uh, within those uh, variation, uh, you can also highlight and see some of uh, the historical events, as well as uh, economic uh, strategies that have changed along the years and have led, have led to a different type of perspective. Obviously, the economic uh, industrialization, uh, the glo global economic superpowers like Britain, you know, something that uh, represented the history of the empire. But the issue is, uh, how can we face poverty uh, nowadays? Now, interesting enough, in this disconcerting image that was uh, taken in, in, uh, for the Sudan famine in 1994, by a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, photographer that unfortunately had his own uh, sad uh, story himself, somehow was identified by Ambassador Hamad Kamal, the UN uh, Pakistani retired ambassador of the United Nations, uh, who I, was, I invited uh, in 2005 to speak at the annual School of Public Service lecture. He described this image uh, as the first representation of globalization. Now you would think, you know, well, certainly this is a pretty shocking image, uh, but really to think this is about globalization takes a little bit of a reflection because uh, it is actually indeed about globalization if you understand it uh, uh, with the phenomenon of uh, this proximity of uh, time, this proximity of space, now that, uh, you know, it's that refined image is not just uh, miles and miles away from you, but is in front of me, in front of us. In that sense, globalization is this. Other symbols of globalization is, you know, the looking at the world as one planet and one, uh, one uh, you, know, a, you know, little world that everybody inhabits. Uh, the internet is another example. But also, you know, friends like uh, Albert Einstein, you know, when he was asked during the, the time in which uh, there were still uh, discriminatory assessments uh, regarding the 
uh, racial diversity, particularly against uh, Jewish uh, uh, people. He was asked, what's your race? The answer is simply <laughs> human race. <laughs> his, his race is human. Another interesting uh, video, uh, uh, actually movie, an Hollywood movie, is uh, Beyond Borders. If you haven't watched it, I suggest you to watch it. It's pretty powerful. The, by reading the script of this movie, it was uh, Angelina Jolie, the actress, uh, was uh, changed uh, her commitment and life, not only because of her commitment uh, to adopt kids at the same time of uh, shooting this movie, but uh, also because she became the goodwill ambassador for the UN Agency for Refugees, the UNHCR. And she's still very active since then. So I invite you to look at it because it's quite uh, interesting. Maybe we can, we can see a little bit of an interview here that shows the preview of the video as well. Angela Jolie is here since winning an Oscar for her performance in Girl Interrupted. She's managed to maintain her status as one of Hollywood's best young actors with the popular Tomb Raider film. She's also traveled the world as one of the United Nations' most recognizable goodwill ambassadors. Her interest in refugee work came after reading the script for her latest movie, Beyond Borders. Here is a look at the trailer for the film. How did I get here? In another godforsaken country. Wanting to find you again. The truth is, I never really knew how it would end. The only thing I am sure of is how it began. So are you married? No man in my village, one woman over 18. In my tribe, it's 30. <laughs> You've met Nick, who's our team leader and full-time doctor. Is that perfume? You're wearing perfume in the middle of the desert. Is there something you want? So you'll see, and I invite you to see this uh, nice uh, movie because uh, it's, it's, it's helpful to show, again, in the Hollywood way, some of the reality uh, that are challenging, particularly for refugees and people who cross uh, the border cross the border for necessity, for, for resistance, for cross the border uh, because uh, they want uh, to establish a new reality, to help uh, to establish a new reality in other uh, places. Unfortunately, those uh, borders are still existing, in existence uh, as we uh, speak. Uh, you know, there are new instances of threats for nuclear war, uh, between North Korea and South Korea and the United States, so obviously the conflicts and the uh, situation of inequality are still in existence. Other expressions here are from, uh, you know, the, the photographs on the left uh, kind of shows this uh, contradiction between uh, globalization from above, uh, which represents uh, the signing of the NAFTA agreement, and the globalization from below in the picture taken from the Seattle protest against the WTO. So, go back to the original questions about what is globalization. You know, there are different kinds of globalization. People like Milton Friedman, that certainly in his uh, agenda of uh, supporting a kind of more neoliberal uh, perspective, uh, have obviously led the way to people like Ronald Reagan to initiate the so-called Reaganomics, you know. Uh, or uh, David Harvey, which is certainly part of one of those critical uh, minds uh, of uh, those who review globalization and see it as simply as a new imperialism, actually even an imperialism, as it was in the past. Some more positive uh, people, as we heard uh, earlier, of, like Thomas Friedman, and others that are kind of more reformist, uh, like Joseph Stiglitz, uh, chief economist, uh, uh, of uh, the World Bank for a while, as well as advisor to the Clinton administration and quite uh, well-known uh, economist. So, but the problem with the globalization is also the fact that, that uh, there are numerous st uh, still situation of uh, inequality. So the Gini factor is about, uh, you know, the Gini coefficient associated with the measurement of inequality still represents uh, these problems in the world. 
So I'm going to go fast and show you other some of the dynamics and some of the slides here that uh, represent uh, these kind of uh, definitions of globalization from the World Bank. Uh, and I invite you to uh, look at them uh, in a PowerPoint that I will post it uh, for you so you can follow in more details those links. And, uh, and as well as look at some of these definitions, you know, from Roland Robinson to Martin Albro uh, to Anthony Gittins to David Held, uh, again, Thomas Friedman, and other connected uh, topics and notions, you know, like neoliberalism, globalism, localism, localization, the intersection between global and local. The Balkanization, this fragmentalization you know, of the Balkans, which was almost a contradiction of globalization. The Brazilianization, this intersection of inequality and mixing of cultures. The ethics of globalization, you know, like uh, Peter Singer has written this very interesting book on the one world analyzing the ethical challenges of globalization. Or the global ethics, you know, from Hans Kuhn perspective. Uh, on uh, global ethics, beyond uh, religious diversity or of uh, other perspectives, there are you know those people that are kind of more you know in in, in favor of globalization, or those that are more skeptical. And again, some others would prefer to look at globalization in the, how do we make this work the best. Like C.K. Pranad, with the BOP, the base of the pyramid approach, uh, it's one of those. Amartya Sen, certainly, in his proposition of uh, development as freedom, and kind of following and extended his original idea of Milton Friedman, you know, capital as freedom. Uh, is focusing more on this uh, attempt to reconcile the globalization from above and the globalization from below. Globalization from below, you know, it's an interesting movement, but it's, it's interesting and it's difficult to the balance, you know, between these two elements. So again, looking at these different uh, trends, you know, for economic trends and with the different actors that participate to this, you know, obviously multinational corporation, the division of labor are part of it, but also the fact that this lead to many other concerns uh, on a predatory globalization, on the domination of the corporations, and uh, also of the so-called nationalization of the world. On the political globalization uh, uh, part, you know, there are numerous uh, studies that uh, focus more on the diminishing relevance of states uh, and the super, uh, you know, kind of going beyond uh, these superpowers and focusing more on global governance. And, uh, you know, so what, what does this mean for public service? That's an important question for us. You know, uh, if we look at this dynamic also of globalization, you know, can uh, also international development be part uh, of a dimension of uh, domination? And how do we intersect more with cultural diversity so that uh, there is a more integration and more adaptation rather than imposition, you know, whatever that is? into a more hybrid type of situation. So I want to show you here a few insights in terms of the understanding the megatrends, because uh, the study of globalization is really about uh, understanding what are the future trends. Not that we are uh, you know, magician that we can understand the future, but by understanding some of the trends, some of the dynamics, we can better project not only ourselves as individuals, as uh, active global citizen, uh, but also uh, with understanding, you know, what are the priority, priority of states, priority of economic investments, and priority of interest, you know, of uh, population and civil society. And, you know, what, who are these game changers? You know, that's the part of the critical analysis. How do we 
understand these organizations not just themselves, but really within their, their roles and relations and partnerships in particular. So the future worlds are some of the results within those analyses. You know, we could have a simple stealth engines that uh, we don't go ahead in this uh, process, and the U.S. draws inward and globalization stalls. Or the fusion, particularly with the superpower of China, the emerging China and U.S. Uh, as a leading roles, or the genie out of the bottle with the increasing inequality, or the non-state world uh, driven by new technology and non-state actors. So, again, something to think about is about uh, globalization. Globalization is a new important dynamics, but somehow is perceived too heavy of a burden for some. So, interesting picture. So, uh, these are some resources for you to know more. And uh, I also invite you to look at uh, some uh, videos that are posted uh, on the UN seminar website. One is a long video of Stiglitz's presentation uh, on globalization, and the other one is from Ambassador Hamad Kamal, uh, that I mentioned earlier, the retired ambassador uh, from Pakistan at the UN, who gives an overview about uh, globalization, and the link is available on your UN seminar website. So, with this, uh, I just uh, want to conclude and, uh, and thank you for uh, the participation in uh, this uh, first session and overview of globalization. As you've seen, it's certainly a complex phenomenon that we will go over in the remaining 10 sessions in looking at these uh, dynamics uh, uh, from a political to economic, particular social, uh, cultural, environmental uh, elements. So we look forward to uh, do this uh, together. And until next.